we go. Sure. Um, so, um, so everyone that's joined, thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, this is another one of our international VP talk series. We have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Mansur Razminia today. He's from Amita St. Joseph in Illinois. He's a, a cardiac electrophysiologist and an expert in intracardiac echocardiography. And he's gonna give us his uh, view on his uh, approach to using uh, intracardiac echo in the EP lab. Thank you, Mansoor, for um, taking the time to prepare the talk and to uh, give us this very uh, interesting presentation, so. Thank you so much, Alejandro. My uh, thank you all the colleagues uh, that are online watching late um, tonight. Um, so I'm gonna show some tips and tricks for optimal ICE usage. I've done several webinars for the past several weeks. So I made mainly I was talking about AFib, how to place the ice inside the left atrium or ventricular tachycardia. And some of them are on YouTube or online. So I decided just actually change a little bit of the subject for tonight, do a little bit more, a little bit different than uh, what I have presented in the past. Uh, so just a little bit more concentrating on atrial tachycardia, during the COVID time, uh, I'm not doing any TEE, so I try to just put the ice inside the, you know, different structure to be able to ruling out the left atrial appendage. So just show you guys some tips and tricks. It's going to be a long movie again. It's about a 50 minute movie, but um, feel free to stop me at any time, any of you guys, or at the very end, I would be more than happy to answer any questions. All right. So we're gonna talk about tips and tricks for optimal ice usage. These are my disclosures. Why should we rely more on mapping and ice as opposed to X-ray? So Mansoor, I'm, sorry sorry to interrupt. We're not seeing your slides. Um, oh, you're not seeing the movie? No, no, oh, we're hold seeing- on Hold on a second. I'm so sorry, hold on. We're seeing you. Oh, okay. Um, I and this. I in Chicago. That. All right, good. Okay, give me one second. It's a nice view of Chicago. Thank you, thank you. Now you're gonna be seeing this. Do you see it? Oh, so everyone else can see it except me. So maybe this is my problem. Are you guys uh, seeing my uh, my movie now? Uh, uh, it sounds like other people can see it. I, for some reason, I'm not being able to see it. All right, I can see it now, sorry. I have my screen upside down. Oh, no worries. Uh, Are you guys seeing my tips and trick on it? Yeah, every, everyone can see it now. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Very We're good. all good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. That's good news. All right. <clears throat> so these are my disclosures. Why should we rely more on mapping and ice as opposed to x-ray? Uh, they, we all know that there are uh, many reasons behind it. All of us, we have seen pictures like this. This is a patient who, have, who has had uh, several coronary angiogram. Actually, this is a, these are the hands of an orthopedic surgeon after 20 years of practicing uh, using fluoroscopy. And you see what has happened to, those, to that physician's hand. And these are us or other staff that we are gonna have all those pain in the knees, you know, back, and even if you are a superman, you are still going to use that, you know, uh, lead. So uh, you cannot get away with it. So I decided just to talk a little bit about getting the femoral arterial access. I know that everybody knows how to do the venous. I want to talk a little bit on femoral arterial access. As you see that when we press with the ultrasound probe, yeah, here now you can see the artery. So you can see the superficial and deep femoral artery, which is a bifurcation. If I just try to do a little bit more cranial and look at it more cranially, you're gonna be able to see the common femoral artery. So, and then if I do a little bit more caudally, you would be able to see that these two. So if you see it and you do cranial, and of course, if you go ahead and clock it in 90 degree and being able to see it longitudinally, so you know exactly how much you are above the bifurcation, and for us that, you know, those of us that we want to use angiocelloperclose, you know you are pretty safe. So you should not be worried about it that you're going to be using perclose. There is absolutely no reason. Let's look at it. This is femoral artery. 
and I'm gonna go and do a clockwise rotation, and now you can see the bifurcation. You can see that it's a bifurcation. Here you can see that <clears throat> deep femoral artery, superficial femoral artery, and this is a common femoral artery. So what you just need to know, you just go on, uh, you know, just do here, you, you can see the pulsation of the artery, and you can go ahead and get the axis above the bifurcation, and you know that it's going to be pretty safe to be able to, you know, definitely you're not going to go to cause retroperitoneal issue, you're not going to go, you know, passing the posterior wall, because you see your needle exactly entering the artery. So now let's uh, talk about ice. So I always use the 10 French sheet, actually a long sheet on the left side. This is a, and go through the left side. So this is ice. Uh, this is a basic of ice. I always have to talk to everybody about this basic of ice, that as to how you can differentiate where you are. As you notice here, you can see that that is the IVC right there on the very top. You all, when you're advancing, you always want to make sure that you see an echo-free space um, in front at the leading edge of this, you know, ice catheter. That is very important. So as you see it, you can see here, so you can see the liver, you can see the inferior vena cava. As you're advancing it, you're going to go to the right side of the screen, correct? Because the legs are on the left side of the screen, head is on the right side of the screen. But it is not always as easy because sometimes you can see this. So I can, you can see that actually IVC is becoming kind of slanted. Sorry, hold that. Okay, here. If I, IVC is getting slanted, how do I get to that IVC? I want to dive into that IVC if it is slanted by doing anterior tilt. So when I do the anterior tilt, I get to that area. And when I get to that area, what happens is that I make that area horizontal because I am inside that very IVC. Let's look at it again. If the IVC is like this, I cannot advance it unless I see that IVC horizontal because I'm gonna show you shortly that those two dots that tell you where your ice catheter is, has to always be horizontal. You cannot advance this way. Your, your, your monitor is gonna be always like this. So you always wanna see everything horizontal. If you have any difficulty, go ahead and advance your catheter. You know that you can advance the catheter basically uh, by mean of using your mapping system. And you know that catheter went to the right atrium for that matter, wherever inside the heart, go ahead and follow that catheter. So now you know exactly where that catheter is, so you put your ice. But putting the ice inside the IVC, from IVC to the RA could be challenging. Let's look at the normal. This is a usual. 99% you're gonna see this. Maybe nine, not 99, maybe 90%. IVC going to the right atrium, no issue whatsoever. And you can see that way. But if you don't pay attention, your ice may go to the hepatic vein either here or down there. So because of that, you want to avoid that. How do I avoid that? I want to get rid of this structure on the top. So how do I do that? I want to dive into the right atrium by performing the anterior tilt. So when I do the anterior tilt, I just go ahead and advance it inside the right atrium. So that is a simple case. So I'm doing a slow motion here. I'm doing the anterior tilt. I'm making the ice go down and then I advance it like this. This is another case, IVC, RA. This is a hepatic vein on the top, hepatic vein in the bottom. How do I have to do? I have to go between these two here. This is a gate to the right atrium. I made it horizontal and I just went to the right atrium. So now you can see I'm in the right atrium, but Sometimes it could be really challenging. So let's look at the challenging case. Here you can see the challenging case. Let's see what we are dealing with. IVC, I have to come like this, go to the right atrium. Okay, so what else do we see? We see the hepatic vein right there. We see hepatic vein right there. So it is a zigzag. I have, it is like 
you are going, uh, you know, in the Lakeshore Drive, you're going to go right, left. You have to understand it, how you can manipulate your eyes to go towards the tricuspid valve. That's a non-coronary cause. Or you go that way towards the SVC. So this is real. That's why sometimes your wire, your catheter doesn't want to go to the right atrio because you see how small that orifice is that you have to advance everything. And if I put the color, you can appreciate, you know, how much, you know, we can see that, that jet over there. Look at that. That is the CS catheter, the decapolar catheter. So I was able to read the eyes back to be able to see that orifice. So now, I advanced my ice catheter, uh, I, a CS catheter. Now I'm advancing the J wire towards the SVC for because I'm going to do transeptal puncture. If I I just had to pull back the ice to be able to see this orifice to be able to manipulate, and now I have to do the ice itself. So you have to keep doing claw counter a little bit uh, anterior tilt posterior tilt to be able to manipulate through that orifice. Now ultimately come to the right atrium and you can see that there is a lead there. What do we see in the home view? This is all we know about, uh, repetitive, but it's always good to keep talking about it. This is a CTI, we do the flutter line, his region, RV and RVOT, and you can see the inferior vena cava there, okay? So everybody at the very beginning, catheter is, uh, you know, uh, come to the right atrium and neutral. So first thing first, you always want to advance the eyes into the right ventricle. Why? Because you want to make sure there is no, there is, if there is a pericardial effusion, you haven't caused it. This is a baseline pericardial effusion. How do you go to the right ventricle? Remember, you want to dive. How do you dive into the right ventricle? You perform the anterior tilt. Anterior tilt is one of the most common ones that you have to use. Here you can appreciate that I'm going from the eyes, from the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, correct? But let's look at it a little bit closely. I want you guys to pay attention to this. So you see those two dots here? Those two dots are actually my ice catheter, the tip of the ice catheter. So make it much easier for me to understand. People say, where is your ice catheter? I said, here it is. You see those two dots? One dot is the distal part. The other dot is the proximal part of the transducer. So if I rotate it and looking it down, so ray is coming down and these two dots are the tip of the ice catheter. You can appreciate right there. So by looking at it, those two dots, you can always know where your ice catheter is. My ice catheter is here in the right atrium because both dots are inside the right atrium. Here you can appreciate that it is inside the right atrium on the top because those two dots are in the right atrium. I just went through the tricuspid valve, so I passed the tricuspid valve. Not that both dots are inside the right ventricle. It means my ice is inside the right ventricle. And here, if I advance it a little bit more, look at that. Look what happened. I don't see the black thing in front of my eyes. I see a tissue. You're going to be very careful because you know the tip of the eyes is touching the wall of the right ventricle. If you advance it a little bit more, you're going to perforate. That's how you know how, how much to advance it. You never want to get close to a tissue which is going to become white. Let's look at it again. This is the ice catheter. How do I go into the right ventricle? Anterior tilt. You always perform anterior tilt, make kind of getting diving inside the right ventricle. You literally dive with the anterior tilt. When you dive into the right ventricle, remember those two dots are always going to be horizontal on the top. So you are not making the right ventricle horizontal. You are seeing the right ventricle horizontally because you know that your ice catheter is inside the right ventricle. One last example. This is a right ventricle. You want to see it horizontally means those two dots went to the right ventricle. And when you are in the right ventricle, you always undo the anterior tilt and you rotate the eyes to be able to see the left ventricle clockwise rotation. So here we just did a clockwise rotation. Here you can appreciate this patient has maybe marginal trace physiologic pericardial effusion, but here 
you want to see this. If I see this at the beginning of the, my AFib ablation before doing anything, not even putting the CS catheter up, nothing. Basically, the first catheter ice, I haven't caused this. This is fluid. This is not blood. But if I see this one during my ablation, especially Murphy's Law tells you that sometimes the blood pressure would drop, and then I would think that that is the blood I caused, and we do a pericardiosynthesis and we see there is no blood. So you want to record this for at least 30 seconds, one minute of it. This is anterior. Survey the heart. Look at the anterior part of it, posterior part of it, because in the middle of the procedure, if the blood pressure drops, you come back and compare it with this. At the end of the procedure, if you want to send the patient home in four hours, you want to make sure this has an increase. So let's talk about how we can visualize the coronary sinus. So this is the coronary sinus. I just, from the home view, I clocked it a little bit. I was able to see the coronary sinus. But if you perform a little bit left tilt and clockwise rotation, you come back a little bit left and clockwise rotation with your eyes, you almost always see the longitudinal aspect of the coronary sinus. You can see TBCN valve here. You can see the coronary sinus here. So this is another case. I just perform again left tilt, clockwise rotation, and here you can see the fenestration of it in the Tbilisian valve. You have to have fenestration, of course. You know that they have to communicate, and that's how we put the CS inside. But again, if I do a little bit more uh, post, uh, you know, left and clock, you can see that even the CS catheter inside the CS, and you can even appreciate that's my ablation catheter inside the CS, and this is a case of persistent AFib. Um, ablating inside the coronary sinus. And you can see those bubbles, you can see everything very clearly, and you can see that you're touching the tissue, everything. You don't take anything for granted, you see it, everything. Here you can appreciate I'm burning inside the coronary sinus, it is touching the LA wall, but I'm inside the coronary sinus. So you can see both the catheter, the ablation catheter, and the CS. So I talked about the fact that I want to talk to you guys about visualizing the left atrial appendage, because we want to avoid TE, especially in this era of COVID. So how do we do that? If you're going to go to the right ventricle, what do we do? We just do anterior tilt, dive into the right ventricle. If you go then clockwise rotation, a little bit, not too much, here, you just did here, you saw the left ventricle, correct? So a little bit more clockwise rotation, here you're going to see the left atrial appendage right there. If you do a little bit more clockwise rotation, you're going to see the RVOT and pulmonary artery. You don't want to do that. You see the left atrial appendage. I do not suggest this view to rule out thrombus, even if these are the good views, but I think these are suboptimal. I would not suggest that. What do I suggest? I say different areas. So I'm going to show you later on the uh, uh, pulmonary artery, but first let's go to CS. How do I put the ablation catheter inside the coronary sinus? You can appreciate ablation, I'm sorry, the CS, uh, the ice inside the coronary sinus. You can see the ablation and CS going into the coronary sinus now. Now I want to dive the ice into the coronary sinus. How do I dive it again? Remember, I want to do anterior tilt. So you see that those two dots are not going to change. So you see the CS is going up. You see now, you see that is where the CS is, how we want to advance it. But I have to do a little bit more anterior tilt, still not inside the CS. You see the CS catheter. I want to go that way inside the CS. I have to do a little bit more anterior tilt. tilt and now you can see those two dots are inside the coronary sinus. Means my ice catheter is inside the coronary sinus. Okay? So if I advance it a little bit more, you can even see some of our nightmares, one of the nightmares, view sense valve that sometimes we cannot advance any wire or CS catheter, et cetera, or LV lead. That's the view sense valve inside the coronary sinus. So when you are inside the coronary sinus, if you perform a little bit clockwise rotation of the ice, you are going to be able to see the left atrial appendage. This is one of the views that I would recommend. It is a little bit more challenging view as opposed to pulmonary artery, but you know, you've got to know 
all the ways that you would be able to rule out. But this is one way of, of course, you can see how nicely here, you can see the, that is the left atrial appendage. You can see the apex of the left atrial appendage. And if you go down counterclock your eyes, you can see that um, three chamber view, left atrium, left ventricle, and right ventricle to the left side of the screen. So this is the coronary sinus view of it. More practical, easier way to do, it's going to be doing it from pulmonary artery. How do we do it again? Remember now we are going to advance the eyes inside the right ventricle, as I showed you earlier. How do we do that? We perform anterior tilt, dive into the right ventricle. I'm going through the tricuspid valve. I went to the right ventricle. Remember, always release that anterior tilt. You want to be neutral inside the right ventricle. So as soon as I release it, I'm going to see the left ventricle here. If I clock it a little bit more, remember I'm going to see that left atrial appendage and then RVOT and pulmonary valve, pulmonary trunk. If I go and clock it a little bit more, the eyes. So now I'm going to be able to see RVOT. Here coming the pulmonary trunk and coming the pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery to the left and right pulmonary artery to the right. So remember now, again, my eye catheter on the screen is on the top. The pulmonary artery is right here. What should I do to get to the left pulmonary artery? Dive into that pulmonary artery by performing anterior tilt. It's always diving into the structure. So I'm diving into that structure by doing the anterior tilt. You see now that pulmonary structure artery becoming horizontal because I went to that pulmonary artery. I'm very close to the left pulmonary artery right now. At this stage, if I go down counterclock my eyes, I'm gonna be able to see the left atrial appendage. Here you can see the left atrial appendage. I have a mapping catheter inside the left atrial appendage, left superior from my vein, as well as the ridge. Again, you can see here, left atrial appendage. You can completely look at entire area of the left atrial appendage. You can see, you can go ahead and do the, you know, color Doppler as well as a little bit doing fine movement of the eyes. Here, that view is perhaps much better than a TEE view for you. You can see it so nicely, the apex of the left atrial appendage and being able to rule out that there is no left atrial appendage traumas. But what if you cannot see the left atrial appendage prior to transeptal? Um, please don't try this at home. It is, it is a little bit more challenging, sorry for the uh, glitch here, but we are gonna look at the view from the left atrium. So I have shown it before how I put the ice inside the left atrium, but here I went to the left atrium. This is, the patient had mitral valve annuloplasty and tricuspid valve and aortic valve. So I, that's why I couldn't see the left atrial appendage and we didn't have TEE, we had some malfunctioning of the TEE. So here you can see that the left atrial appendage is ligated during the, you know, valvuloplasty. But I was able to see a, interestingly, you can see that orifice right there. So there is a leak of that. That's why we say, please, to the surgeon, never ligate, just excise it. You know, here you can even look at the color Doppler and you can see the communication between left atrial appendage. And I went ahead, I took a peek inside that left atrial appendage. Don't try it at home, that's what I just said. I just gently went with the eyes and look at what I saw inside that. That is a thrombus inside that very left atrial appendage. So of course, we didn't perform any procedure, but this is what you want to show it to the surgeon and tell them, please do not ligate. This is another case. I had to again go to the left atrium to be able to see it. You can see left superior pulmonary vein ridge and left atrial appendage, and that is the thrombus there that you can see this is in the left atrial appendage with my eyes being inside the left atrial appendage. So procedure was canceled. Let's to, uh, talk about the device leads. Here is the case of the, you know, you can always, people say, how can you do procedure with device leads? I say, it is much easier to look at it with eyes as opposed to with the x-ray because you can manipulate your catheter depending on how the 
you know, the leads are. It is very sensitive to be able to see all of them. This is an LV lead entering into the coronary sinus. Remember, how do I look at the longitudinal of the CS? I perform left and clock. So as soon as I perform left and clock, I'm going to see now the coronary sinus and that is the LV lead inside the coronary sinus. So even if I'm burning inside the CS, I know that if I'm close to the lead, now I'm not close to the lead where I'm burning. So this is how you can differentiate. This is one other thing I want to mention. 99 to 100% of patients with leads, they have thrombus. So if you see a thrombus during the TE, if the patient is febrile, doesn't mean necessarily it is a vegetation. Everybody has thrombus. That's why we don't put these leads inside the left ventricle or left atrium because they're going to have a stroke. Every lead, if you look at it clearly, they are all going to have thrombus. A small thrombus, big thrombus. This is our really another thrombus. Here is this another RV lead. I just added this last week. This was another case that you can appreciate. That's a thrombus going to RV lead, see, uh, the ICD lead going to the right ventricle, like on the CT isthmus. This is another case. And you can even see that RV lead and RA lead, let's look what to see here. This is my RA lead, correct? And my RA lead is going where? To the right atal appendage. So I know this is RA lead. And there is another lead. Look at that lead. That lead is RV lead. And interestingly enough, they are coming, they are touching to each other, they are attaching to each other. And then you can see a lot of thrombus at the area of the attachment. Look at that. This is where that, imagine you are going to, of course, you know, you want to do lead extraction or so forth. So this is how it shows you where exactly your leads look like. So I'm going to switch the gears for the people who are going to do uh, let's say they are going to do cryo balloon, or they, for that matter, they want to change the uh, a sheet to another sheet. So from the left atrium, you have done a transeptal inside the left atrium, so you want to exchange your sheet. In this case, uh, we are going to do for cryo. We are going to do flex cat. So here the sheet comes out. So we have already done the uh, here. The flex cat is going up. Majority of time. Full disclosure, I haven't done cryo for over two years. I'm not, but this is, these are the old movies that I had when I was performing. But in any case, I'm just trying to show you guys sheet exchange. How do I do that? So it was very easy. I kept the wire, the sheet went there, but we know that this is maybe 30, 40% of time. Majority of time, many times we may have difficult sheet exchange. This is something that I have been doing, I was doing, and for some, if I'm planning to do Watchman or other things, if I'm gonna, if I see the sheet doesn't go to the left atrium, one thing I would suggest is the following. You see, I'm doing whatever I can do, it is not going. So here is the wire, because of that step up, you cannot put the sheet and dilator inside the left atrium. You just need a hammer or something just to knock on it, just to be able to put it in the left atrium. Rather than doing that, what you can do is, of course, some people do veno, uh, you know, uh, plasty, septoplasty stuff. But one of the easier way to do is the following. If you're gonna have a CS catheter, a decopolar catheter, you can certainly advance that decopolar catheter inside the left atrium. So it went adjacent to the very same wire. So now as I'm advancing the sheet and dilator, that is gonna be like, body wire for me, that decapolar catheter. As I'm advancing, I pull back the decapolar exclusively 100% of time. We never had any problem advancing this uh, sheet and dilator there. Let's look at it. You see, it is not going in, okay? So what I did, I pulled back the sheet and dilator. The wire is there. The rest of the wire is there, and you can appreciate that sheet and dilator are sitting in the right atrium. Here, I just go then advance that CS catheter to the very same hole. So I find the hole and advance the CS catheter with the eyes inside the left atrium. You can appreciate it is going nicely inside the left atrium. As I'm advancing the sheet and dilator, I pull back the, the copolar catheter, it just jumps in. It is like a body wire, it, it just jumps in because it prevents that step up of the sheet and dilator. Let's look at another example. I give it a little bit of color Doppler here, and you know that this is 
where my wire is going. So you just put a little bit of, and you can see wire very nicely there. Here is my CS catheter, just went to the left atrium. I'm advancing the sheet and dilator. Here I'm pulling back the CS catheter. You see as soon as CS catheter comes towards the right atrium, I advance the sheet and dilator to the left atrium. And you can appreciate that everything goes gently to the left atrium. I'm gonna talk about SVT ablation today. I'm gonna to show you three type of SVT ablation. One is gonna be AVNRT. If you are using ice for other, and if the patient goes to AVNRT uh, during other procedures, why not using the ice? I uh, recently actually shared this one on Twitter. So, so this is the, uh, you know, this is the area of the interest. You, we all know that this is a region of the His. This is a coronary sinus. Where is the target in majority of cases you're gonna ablate for the AVNRT? It's gonna be right there. It's gonna be a little bit posterior to the region of the His. It's gonna be a little bit anterior to the region of the CS. So remember that, posterior to the His, anterior to CS. We all know that, but we wanna remember this while we are looking at the ice. So let's look at the ice from the home view and try to compare how this looks like on the ice. This is a home view, right atrium, right ventricle, region of the His. We all know that, correct? So if I can go, I can go down here, show you my uh, His catheter. That is my His catheter. We know that that is in the His, in the His region, and we also see a His electrogram, of course, if I have that electrogram right there. So if I have the His catheter right there, correct? And that is my ablation catheter. Remember, I want to clock, if I clock the ice, I want to see the ablation catheter. I do not want to see the His catheter because I have clocked the ice from the His region a little bit. So you should not be able to see the His region, His catheter, you should be able to see the ablation catheter. So we just clocked it from the home view a little bit, the ice. So if I just go down, clock it a little bit, the ice, I should not be able to see the ablation catheter anymore. I have to be able to see the CS because ablation is a little bit anterior to the CS. So if I go down counterclock my eyes a little bit, I should be able to see my ablation catheter. Remember, because ablation is anterior to the coronary sinus, posterior to the His. So here, you see, now I can see my ablation catheter. That is exactly the region of the interest. You can see here, right there, it is because of the heart motion. It is not touching nicely, but now it is touching. Patient is injunctional and I'm done. And I know that it is a very good area. I'm not close to the His. I'm a little bit in front of the coronary sinus. Of course, you can drag it up a little bit more anteriorly, go towards the right side of the screen in case you want to go a little bit more if, uh, towards the His, in case you don't get any good junctional rhythm. But that is how you do this. Let's talk about parahesian accessory pathway. If you are gonna use ice and you are gonna use the open window. So I'm gonna show you this case. Interestingly, you can appreciate 2-3 AVF is positive, but the, you know, you can see that uh, actually the uh, V1, V2 was, you know, negative V3, what transition was in V3. But this is my HD grid. I'm advancing the HD grid in the area of the His, but now I'm opening the window. So I'm getting the A and V to see where is the area that has the fastest contact connection between the A and V to be able to know where my accessory pathway is. This was a parahesian accessory pathway. Here is the catheter and here is my uh, you know, mapping system. And you can appreciate that is right there. You can see, I can put a skate, uh, you know, uh, ice skating there and it goes fast. That is the area of the interest that I know I'm gonna, of course, freeze, not, I don't wanna burn. And here you can see, I'm putting the cryo catheter there, but interestingly enough, if you look at that, that is my cryo catheter. You can see A and B are very, you know, it is like a sign of like very close to each other. But interestingly, you can even see, I'm touching the His catheter. So you see the artifact on the ablation and you see the artifact on the His catheter. So you know, so this is my ablation catheter going towards the very region, and now I start cryoing, and you can see the ice ball is slight, slowly forming here. It is right on the top of the His region. And very interestingly, 
Here you can see that we went cryo on. You can see that a little bit of artifact. This is on cryo on. So within seven seconds, let's see what happens. Within seven seconds, here. So interestingly enough, you can see the, how nicely the hiss is. But even more interesting, you can see the hiss on the very ablation catheter. But cryo is really, I have been doing this for 17 years with cryo, thank God, never had any AV block, but cryo is really forgiving. Even though I'm seeing the hiss on it, but if I see immediately a block, I stop it, so I have never had any block. So here you can see, but we were able to continue for four minutes of cryo here, and here you can see the ice ball, and you can appreciate that after the after I'm done with the uh, uh, complete you know uh, block uh, and the complete ablation, you can see the how much hiss I had on the top on my ablation catheter, but it was successful procedure until we wait a little bit and you're going to see this thing. So. For those of you who are panicking, I please do not panic. I'm joking, of course. This was just 18 milligram of adenosine I gave just to make sure that the accessory pathway is not gonna come back. So that was nothing. The patient is doing very fine. I did this procedure a few months ago and no recurrence of accessory pathway. And that, that what you, we just saw what secondary to uh, 18 milligram of adenosine make sure pathway is not coming back. And this is what you can also see on the EKG when the pathway went away. I want to also show you why guys one left lateral accessory pathway. So let's look at it. We all use eyes for transeptal. So why not to use it to locate the ablation catheters? Let's look at it. You can appreciate that we have few PVCs from the RB catheter and then patient goes to left lateral accessory pathway, CS distal in the, in the lower portion. So you can see that we have eccentric activation in the coronary sinus. Here again, this is a little bit, you can see that um, this is a little bit a different speed and you can see right there we are doing entrainment uh, through the RV, being able to start ablating it so that we don't have movement of the catheter. So we are pacing almost the same. And then as soon as we go RF on within two seconds, you can see the activation changes. And we got rid of that left lateral axillary pathway, but let's look at the ice. Let's see how it looks on ice. So here is the ice. So here my ice catheter is also in the left atrium. You can appreciate that that is my ablation catheter on the top. This is a left atrial appendage. So ablation catheter should come down now and go towards the mitral valve, not the left atrial appendage. So here you can see left atrium, left ventricle. That's the ablation catheter at the junction of the left atrium and the left ventricle. You see, it just jumped into the left atrial appendage. I don't want this. So as soon as I see it, I'm gonna stop burning. You wanna make sure that it comes back, curve it a little bit more, come to that region of the left lateral area. So you can just see that's the ablation catheter so nicely there. And you can see that in that area. You can even see the CS catheter right there horizontally. And this is when you can appreciate where exactly your ablation catheter is. Let's talk about some atypical flutters. This is a case of atypical flutter, even though it is concentric on, uh, in the CS, but you can appreciate that, you know, there are uh, both lead V1, V6, there are uh, positive, uh, you know, uh, flutter waves, and we know that this was a post a ablation. So I'm gonna be mapping this atrial tachycardia with HD grid. So here you can appreciate the HD grid is inside the left atrial appendage. My ice is also inside the left atrial appendage. For those of you who are interested, it is on the, either on, it is on my channel, on, uh, on my, some of my uh, Twitter account. It is in that where I have posted some movies. So I show it there, how you can put your eyes inside the left, uh, left atrium. But here you can see the HD grid inside the left atrial appendage. So I'm not only getting the geometry, I'm getting the activation map, voltage map and everything. And um, here you can see, this is actually another case, interestingly, and you can see how big is the left atrial appendage, that comparing the HD grid with left atrial appendage, you see HD grid is so small because this was a very big atrium. 
So we then go ahead and, you know, we have to put it inside the veins. Here you can appreciate I'm coming out of the left atrial appendage and put it inside the left upper pulmonary vein. So we just advance the grid inside the left upper pulmonary vein. Here you can see the grid there. Here you can see ablation catheter to the left. Here you can see grid is going again to the vein. That is the left superior pulmonary vein. And I'm advancing the grid inside the left superior pulmonary vein. I'm getting all the area, all the geometry, voltage, activation, and everything with my mapping catheter. Here you can see that this is the left inferior pulmonary vein. So I see it. I just put the ice inside, I uh, put the grid inside it. So this is left inferior pulmonary vein. Here it is the right inferior pulmonary vein. I just go down put it inside the right inferior pulmonary vein, the grid. Here you can see going inside the right inferior pulmonary vein. So I'm getting the geometry as well as activation and voltage map. Again, right inferior pulmonary vein. Here you can see the right superior pulmonary vein. Why is it right superior pulmonary vein? Because you see the pulmonary artery. So whenever you see the pulmonary artery, that's going to be the right superior pulmonary vein. I'm doing the, again, the same thing in the right superior pulmonary vein. And now I have done appendage, pulmonary veins. Now I want to do the left atrial proper. So this is a posterior part. This is esophagus. So you can just, you are doing the posterior part of the left atrium. Here you can see that my circa catheter inside the left atrial appendix, that's my uh, esophageal temperature probe. So here is again, you can see the grid. Now this is in the descending aorta. When you see the descending aorta, you're going to be see a still posterior, but you're going to be able to see the left pulmonary veins. So here you can see my ice is inside the right ventricle, right atrium. And now I just made a candy cane with the grid and I'm gonna do like paintbrush, release the curve and do the entire septum. And here you can see, this is doing the entire septum, releasing the curve and do with one, you know, you're painting the left atrium basically. So you can get a nice activation map. Here you can see that I'm doing the anterior part of the left atrium. Why is it anterior part? Because you can see the aorta and ascending aorta on the top. So I'm against the aorta. And so, of course, you can see the propagation map. Let's look at this propagation map. You can see that this is the post afib ablation. And here, if you want to look at the activation, you can see interestingly, anteriorly, let's look at the anteriorly, you can see lines of block. There are two lines of block right there. One is there that you see that it is not passing through. The other one, interestingly, is in the roof. Even though roof tells you as if there is no line of block, you see, you see that it's coming anteriorly, go posterior, it stops, posteriorly come anterior, stops, so it is line of block. So you can see that there is a zone of slow conduction right here in the anterior region, right in this area. So if you look at the posterior, it is passive because it is going very fast and it was stopping here anyway. Remember that it was not passing through here. So what I had to do, I have a lineup block here. I have a block here. So I, per, I just went ahead. I, you know, I connected these two to each other, being able to get rid of that um, uh, atrial tachycardia left-sided. But let's look at the ice. How does it ice look when I'm trying to burn this? So we're gonna look at the ice during the RF ablation of the very same patient. It makes your life much easier because here is the left atrium, here's the left coronary cusp, non-coronary cusp, right coronary cusp, okay? So put my artery, RVOT, and my view is from the left atrium. The ice is inside the left atrium. You see that HD grid is by the aorta, which means that anterior. So now when you look at it here, you look at it on the ice, so you can correlate. So next time you don't even need to look at your map. You know when in the ice, it is right here, where it looks like on the map. So try always to correlate between your map 
and the eye. So I know that my HD grid is in that area. Now I'm going to remove the grid and I'm going to advance my ablation catheter, which is right there. And I know where to go because I know where the right upper pulmonary vein is, which is on the top. So remember, I have to touch this towards the right superior pulmonary vein from here to here. So I can see it and on ice, I can drag that. If you have any question, you don't know exactly, look at your mapping. So keep correlating with each other. And then I would be able to go and uh, connect those two lines and being able to, here you can see that tachycardia, you know, increase in cycle length and uh, terminate it right there. So there is another case. This is eccentric activation in the coronary sinus. Cycle length about two, 320 uh, millisecond. Patient has a, a pacemaker. Let's look at the propagation map with, map with the same way of HD grid. You can see here that it, is, it looks like mitral isthmus flutter. It is mitral isthmus flutter. But interestingly, if you look at that again a little bit anteriorly, you can see that there are two line up block and there is a slow movement right there between those two. So that is the easier way to do it. So being able to just create those and connect them together. And some of these patients are the ones that they have had maze procedure as an during the bypass surgery or so. So that's why you see a lot of line up blocks here and there. And here, I'm gonna just connect those two regions to each other. So I start from the left atrial appendage, go towards the roof. And you can even see, this is my ablation catheter. You can see the tissue reaction going from the left atrial appendage towards the roof, right, which is here. And you can see my ablation catheter right here, touching the tissue. If you don't know exactly where you are on the ice, immediately look at your mapping system. So your mapping system would tell you where you are. So next time when you look at the ice, you know exactly where you are. You don't need to look at mapping system. And again, this is another case that we terminate the tachycardia. I think I have one more, yes. You see, this is a little bit of chevronish, chevron uh, activation in the uh, coronary sinus. Earliest is in like CS3, 4, 5, 6. And when I look at this activation, let's look at this activation. Anteriorly, it's going up. Posteriorly, it's going down. So we know that this is a roof-dependent flutter, very likely. But let's just look at it. Here, if you look at it here, you can see that is the area of the zone of very, very slow conduction, even much slower than the other one. You can appreciate there. So with even sometimes with one or two burn, you would be able to get rid of this. But let's look at that roof line with the eyes. How do I know this is a roof line? With the eyes, I'm seeing the left superior from my vein, right superior from my vein. In between, it is going to be the roof. So when I'm burning that area, I'm, I was able to terminate the tachycardia uh, back to uh, sinus rhythm. <clears throat> so let's talk about atrial tachycardia from right atrial appendage. This is, you see, you can see here, this is a right atrial appendage and you can see a ridge there. Interestingly enough, I was not able to get that ATAC from here. I realized there is a ridge and when I put the ablation catheter on that side, other side that the sign shows, I was able to get the atrial tachycardia. If I don't have eyes, there is no way of me knowing there is a ridge in the right atrial appendage. I have to go to the other side of the ridge, be able to get that atrial tachycardia. This is, this is a case I did last week. Actually, I just added this view yesterday. So here is the right atrium. Patient is having atrial tachycardia from right. But remember, they have done a... Uh, you know, valvuloplasty and valve surgery. So here, this is endocardium, the red. And you see that endocardium is actually, there is a bump there. That bump is the, where perhaps where they put the trocar. And that is the area that I could see it on the ice. And I was able just to put my, you know, grid there immediately. I went there and it was a micro reentry there. But I was able to see that before even put the grid anywhere else. I saw that defect there in the right atrial appendage. I just went there, then I put the ablation catheter there. We got it. Really, sometimes you can see this stuff and you can do the entire procedure maybe sometime in 10, 15, 20 minutes because ice 
make you to live inside that left atrium or right atrium, you can just paint the wall. This is another case uh, which you can see that this is, it is like a polyp of the right atrium. You see, this is a polyp shaped structure in the right atrium. And this guy had PAC from this area, debilitating, debilitating for past 60 years. So I was not worried about doing a biopsy of that, but I was able to know exactly where that polyp shaped structure is in the right atrium and put my ablation catheter and I burned because it was coming from there, interestingly enough. So I had to go all around it and burn that polyp shaped structure of the right atrium to be able to get rid of the PAC. So this is a, I think my last case, this is a case of AFib that had atrial tachycardia post AFib ablation. So I had done an AFib ablation on this woman and then she ended up coming next year, following year for atrial tachycardia. But interestingly, she has a pacemaker. Interestingly, uh, you know, here you have, she has a pacemaker right there. We went to the right ventricle, clocked it, and you see that the patient has actually mechanical mitral valve. So when you see your, with the eyes, it's going to be much safe to be able to see. Here you can appreciate that's a mechanical mitral valve. That's the left inferior pulmonary vein, and that's my ablation catheter between the left inferior pulmonary vein going towards the mechanical mitral valve. But I'm pretty sure I'm not touching anything because I can see that mechanic. But if you look at that yellow thing, all of a sudden, stop. You could see that movement of the you know, mitral valve got slower and you can see it with this one as well. Here you can appreciate as I'm burning, tachycardia stop and patient went to uh, sinus to them. So there is really no limit of doing, using eyes for this all type of endocardial ablation. And with that, I really thank you so much. It was a long uh, and it is late night, but I appreciate for uh, everybody and your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, Mansoor, that was uh, very interesting. Um, I remember having a case similar to that polyp that you mentioned, uh, where we actually ended up going around that structure. It was, um, first I thought it was, a, it was a long eustachian valve, but it was actually separate from the eustachian valve. So we ended up ablating it like, um, like a pop muscle ablation. We went around the structure, did an activation map and, and eliminated the tachycardia. Um, so I want to invite everyone to uh, write down their questions on the chat and I can moderate the questions. I'm going to start asking uh, Mansoor a few questions. Uh, one of the questions um, that I think is important for both for you know first time users or people who are starting to use eyes as well as those that have been using it for a while is regarding the settings. You know, so when you, um, when you start using eyes, you'll, you'll notice in some patients uh, limitations with the quality of the images. And um, there are issues related to the patient and issues related to the settings of the eyes. So specifically, how do you optimize the image quality? Um, do you work on your catheter position? Do you work on the gain settings of the ultrasound? Do you change the frequency of the ultrasound? What are your, what is your approach when you when you when you don't see what you want to see? Uh, if I answer it this way, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting question. I have never ever touched any of those. I don't even know where they are. So basically, my view of using ice is this way. Ice is like you are in a movie theater. You're gonna look at the screen of the movie and there's a guy in front of you. You just come a little bit back to the right, to the left, see that what you can see the movie because there are a few people in front of you. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there is a catheter in front of you. Sometimes there is a lipomatous hypertrophy of the septum. I have shown it before, there are other talks that because of that, there is no way you can see anything inside the left atrium. So you just go down, pass through the very same transeptal go and do it, uh, the ablation in the left atrium. Sometimes you want to see the RVOT. You cannot see it. Put your eyes in the RVOT. So that is how it's going to help you exactly. So to put your eyes catheter very close to where you are burning. I have to tell you guys something very interesting. For about several years, we had issue. We changed our ice machines 
three or four times. Engineering came, everybody came because our ice machine was uh, restarting on its or rebooting. It was going blank screen and we had no idea why. And they were telling me the only lab it was happening was my lab. And finally, one very bright engineer from Abbott came and we realized what the situation was. Because I always put the ice close to my ablation catheter. The ice has a sensor of heat. So when it was getting hot, it was getting blank. So we were thinking that there is a problem with our ice machine. There's a problem with why my technique. It was very close to my uh, ablation catheter. So I really don't even, I have never changed any of those. I just put it in the area of the interest where I want to burn. And just up, the only thing I move is a little bit those knobs to the right and left, or just a little bit making it dark and stuff. That's the only thing I do. I've never touched anything else. At the very beginning, uh, uh, we have, Erin, uh, who comes, he's, she's with Abbott. So she come, she came, she preset everything for me. I don't even know how to change it, to be honest with you. That is all I have. It is just, I'm driving. It is like a cruise for me. It is just, they gave me the cruise. I'm just driving. Yeah, I think, uh, um, I think that's, a, that's a great answer because I think, uh, you know, you can tweak the gain settings, the frequency and, and, the reality is when you're not seeing what you want to see, my, my impression and my experience with ice is that you just need to reposition your catheter. Your ice catheter needs to show you what you want to see. So it's a matter of changing the field of view of the ice catheter, not playing with the settings of the machine. I think that's, I think that's, uh, that, that, that is the correct answer. And I think that's kind of what, what I've seen and what I've seen other people uh, do. Um, I have another question with regards to the right veins. You know, the, the left veins are very easy to see. The right veins are trickier to see. And other than going into the left side with the ice catheter, what are your tricks to get a good view of the right pulmonary veins from the right atrium? I'll, I'm so glad that you asked that question. So I'm gonna tell you about what I use with this uh, view mate. But mm -hmm. I believe that with the car to sound or you know, acunev, you should be the same thing. Remember the letter L on your ice thing, handle mm -hmm. of it, which is the left. Right. One other thing I want you to remember is longitudinal start with L. Mm -hmm. L, L. Mm -hmm. So whenever you want to see anything longitudinally, including coronary sinus or right inferior and right superior pulmonary vein, the moment you see the short axis of the right inferior pulmonary vein, just come down about five millimeter left longitudinal. Remember, do a little bit of left tilt. Not, I'm sorry, not the counterclocking of the thing. Just left tilt and clock. Universally, 100%, you're going to see the entire right inferior pulmonary vein from the right atrium longitudinally. You can do the same thing for right superior pulmonary. So if you see the right superior pulmonary vein from the home view, you're going to go up a little bit and just you're going to clock it, you're going to see the right superior pulmonary vein, correct? When you do that, the moment you see the right superior pulmonary vein, make a note of these three things you're going to do. You pull back the ice catheter less than a centimeter. You make a left tilt a little bit and you clock your ice catheter. Absolutely, if you have any issue, FaceTime me. I would be more than happy to answer your question. You would be able to see there should be absolutely no issue. That's great. Uh, that's a very practical um, um, trick to um, to see those veins because I, I, you know, talking to other people, I've 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 found ways to see them, but I, I I see most people when they try to incorporate ice into their afib ablation workflow, they always. They always say, you know, the right-sided veins are, are are the hardest to see just because of the position, the anatomical position of them. But this is a great way to In get a longitudinal axis of the. Interestingly veins. enough, I have a good news for you. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, actually, when you do this technique, you wish that you could see the left side the same as right side. Really, okay. you because okay. it is so bright, it is so clear 
that you don't even need to put. The reason I put the ice inside the left atrium, because when I'm doing the AFib ablation, I look at the, let's say if I'm looking at the left upper from my vein, I clock it, I see the posterior wall of the left upper on the ice, I put my ablation, I burn it there. I have a didactic on that. So I just look at the ice. I burn while looking at the ice, yeah. not mapping system. That's why I'm so dependent on ice. I put the ice. But if you are relying more on your mapping and you want to get benefit of your uh, ice, just do those two things mm -hmm. and you would be, you would not, you are going to be, you regret that why you never did that. Yeah, so, so, so this leads me to the next question. And you might remember um, Joshua Cooper and I had a discussion and we, we tagged you on that discussion on Twitter about echogenicity. We were talking about a case of a pap muscle right, with the ablation. Very well. And we're talking about, you know, echo brightness. And Joshua was saying, you know, every time I see the pap muscle turn echo bright, um, I know that, that, that the VT, you know, is going to go away, that the PVCs are going to go away. When you don't see that echo brightness in the tissue, then you tend to have more recurrences. We've done some studies on flutter and, and, uh, and to some extent on fibroblations, looking at the echo brightness and trying to correlate that with transmurality. Um, but as you know, it's, it's very hard to quantify echogenicity other than to give it a qualitative assessment. What are your thoughts on, on the use of echogenicity as a surrogate of lesion transmurality? Uh, yeah, I mean, that is an excellent question and absolutely I agree with both you and Josh. Um, uh, Josh it has absolutely a great point and that has been my experience. Um, majority of time, because of the structure of the tissue, the tissue is much thicker, we are much more, we stay there in 50 watt for many minutes maybe, so you see a lot of tissue reaction. You don't mm -hmm. do that much in the left atrium, but right. I almost always see tissue whitening in the right atrium, mm -hmm. left atrium, RV or LV. Most in the LV because I'm much more, you know, liberal in just giving as much because you want to get rid of that if it is intramural PVC or something, you want to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So 100% agree. I, I cannot quantify it, that how you can correlate those but because some part, it could be because of edema. So you really don't know that how much of it you have penetrated in tissue. And of course, sometimes if you keep doing, when you see that, you know, whiteness and you start looking at the type two bubbles, and if you continue a little bit, you're going to have a steam pop. So you want to be very careful. So I, but I always, always, you know, I never remember having a successful ablation, especially in the left ventricle, with not having uh, that echo dense tissue due the, to due the ablation. And I many times I put the, actually the ice inside the left ventricle. So when it is inside the left atrium, I just dive through the mitral valve, go to the left ventricle and get it close to my ablation catheter or mapping catheter in the left atrium. So I can see this uh, very precisely. Um, one last question, uh, Mansoor. What are your thoughts on um, visualization of scar for uh, ischemic VT ablation, you know, looking at scar substrate on eyes, both endocardial and epicardial? Uh, yes, excellent question. Again, uh, many times, majority of time, I don't know, you can see certainly a little bit of hyperdense tissue, but for me, uh, because I look at it very closely, I usually see that tissue is not moving, is not contracting, so I don't see any endocardial mm -hmm. thickening. So I know that that area is very interesting and I make sure that I map this area, that area very closely. But we just did a procedure last week and actually I just, I haven't edited the, you know, I keep making these movies. I told you I have about three something terabytes. Like of having another job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I have that actually, it is here. I'm going to show you. This is on this flash drive. I make them <laughs> from work. I put it in my computer. All of the, I just make these movies on my home computer. But having said that, that guy had a very bad coronary artery disease. And mm -hmm. there was a tiny, you see, this was the endocardium. And you could see like about one and a half centimeter pouch coming out 
of that endocardium. And that when I put the area ablation catheter and grid, I could see tons of fractionation stuff, you know, or not, I mean that lava stuff. So it was very interesting part, but I saw it. Mm -hmm. And when I was looking at the mapping, it was really not showing anything different. But with my eyes, I was able to see it. I went, I did the entire inside of it and outside of it, I completely burned it. So things that we can, I always say, when you look at it with eyes, it is really as if you are inside that home, inside your room, you're painting the wall. You understand the situation much better as opposed to just relying on the mapping. That's why I want to make sure that people rely on both. For me, it is more relying on eyes. But uh, right. perhaps when you keep doing it and when you learn it, where it is on the mapping, keep looking at the eyes. Oh, where is it looking at? The, where does it look on the eyes while it is looking this way on the map? So then next time you, you have more familiar view of when you see it on the eyes, you know where you're supposed to be. Or you intentionally put the catheter in that territory because you check for that area with the eyes as opposed to more with the mapping system. Very good. And then um, do you use uh, contact force catheters? I don't have contact force catheter. We had some issue with our mm -hmm. uh, wiring of our lab. So we brought it, we brought all the engineers of the hospital and from Abbott. And unfortunately, we had a lot of noise and that is right. because of our own lab. So right. I use the contact without any forcing, but I look at the basically with the, with the eyes, uh, I, I can, things that I can see is that I see the impedance change, drop of at mm -hmm. least 10% of EP the impedance. I see the electrograms disappear and I see the tissue reaction. So there are so many things that yeah. I can see. I don't have it, but I have been able to, you know, substitute those by looking at this. The way right. Uh, the so, reason why I ask is because, you know, when contact force catheters came into the market and people started using them, a lot of people mentioned, you know, how how much of a game changer it was for them. But when you talk to the people that do a lot of eyes, you kind of say, well, yes, it's good to have the number, but if I'm seeing everything on eyes, I know when I'm in contact. In fact, many times I, I look at a, you know, I'm doing a procedure and I can see contact on eyes and the, you know, the calibration of the, of the sensing contact force may be a little bit off. And I will rely on the eyes more than on the actual number when I see the tissue responding to the ablation and I see the effect of the ablation on the tissue. So, so, so that, that tissue catheter interface to me is uh, personally more valuable than the actual contact force number. Um, and I know a lot of people are relying on, you know, you know, FTI, ablation index and all these different measures of contact force parameters. Um, which has some inherent limitations depending on the on the type of sensor that you use and the calibration uh, you know can sometimes be an issue so it's nice to see that um you know you you basically use the eyes from a to z right so you use it for anatomy you use it for navigation you use it for assessment of your lesions uh, so you do real time visualization of, uh, of lesion formation with the eyes. I think, I think these are things that um, are underutilized. A lot of people I see use the eyes to go transeptal and then they leave the eyes as if it was some piece of equipment that is only required to go transeptal. I think, I think you know, as, as we use these technologies and, you know, these technologies are expensive. You know, there's an expense to the use of an eyes catheter. Uh, but I think if you maximize the use of the ice, ice catheter, uh, not just to go transeptal, but to, you know, help with the mapping, with the contact, uh, guide your ablation, safety, you know, it's a, it's a tool that enhances your safety in the, in the EP lab. I think you can justify the expense of the use of the catheter. Absolutely. There are so many, you know, like today, um, there is a, we had a CRNA and she's 32 weeks pregnant. And I did a, you know, a left-sided atrial uh, flood. It was roof dependent. And she mm -hmm. was so happy. She's sitting there with no lead. She's so comfortable. And 
So those, you know, so you don't need to ha reassign your CRNA or nurses to the other rooms, other than because you know if they're female, they you know pregnant. So you you, you want to save the baby, you want to save the mom, you want to make right. sure that you know they are protected, so they can sit down and do their procedure as if they are in any other room that mm -hmm. they are not using radiation. At right. the same time, you know, if the procedure goes, I believe definitely with the view of the eyes, the way that you can look at it procedures is going to be much safer. We just had a publication that showed 80% uh, improvement, I think, I mean, as opposed to when you, you rely on the x-ray, that reduction in uh, pericardial effusion by just relying on the eye. So that is very crucial. This was, I believe, just published. And then procedure goes much smoother, much faster. And then you see there is no pericardial effusion. You can check the patient. And I have been sending patients home over a decade the same day, four hours after the procedure. That very ischemic tachycardia that I just told you I did last week, the very AFib, that two AFibs that I did on Monday today, that, that left lateral, everybody goes home. They go home the same day, four hours after the procedure because patient is gonna be happy. So those are the things that you, you wanna look at the cost uh, analysis, analysis. You have to look at mm -hmm. all this data, how much the patient, the hospital pays for the, to keep the patient overnight you know, or for that matter, how much insurance is going to pay somebody because having a back pain, having a back surgery, or, or as opposed to you not coming to work because of the, they have issues, but as opposed to coming and doing the procedure with no let on and be very comfortable, you know, not getting even warm or hot because you have a let on. And so here I have my own surgical chair. I sit on it and I do my procedures. It is, you know, it makes it much much easier it is much uh, i i believe it's very practical much more practical well mansoor i want to thank you and on behalf of everyone who attended today i think we were all very pleasantly um entertained by your very um eloquent very uh, uh didactic talk i think we learned a lot about how you use the eyes in the ep lab i think I, i've certainly learned a lot today about some of the things that you do and uh, looking forward to putting them into practice soon. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, a million thanks for giving us this wonderful talk. Um, the talk is recorded and I will post it on Twitter, on, uh, on YouTube soon. I'll, I'll put a, I'll put a tag on Twitter so that the EP peeps can, can look at it at their leisure. And there's a lot of people probably asleep right now. Uh, but you know, it was, it was absolutely an amazing talk and I want to thank you for, uh, giving us the chance to listen to it and to learn from you. Um, and I look forward to meeting you in the future, hopefully at a conference sometime in the future when things reopen and we kind of go back to some sense of normality. So same here. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. For, thank you for arranging it. And thank you everybody for staying so late and listening to this conversation. And thank you so much. All right. Thank Take care. Okay. Have a good evening. Thank bye bye. You. Thank you everyone. Bye bye.